Welcome. Uh, what I want to do is show you how to graph as well as identify the vertices, co-vertices, foci, and the center. Um, so to do that, uh, particularly we like to have our ellipse in our kind of standard form. And you can see this is not in the form that we're looking for. So um, there's two different you know, forms where A was either under X or A was under B. We need to get this at least into a form and determine you know, what is our A and what is our B. So we need to get this to two sets of binomial squares, or yes, binomial squares. And to go and do that, we have to apply the process of completing the square. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is uh, I'm going to have to complete the square twice. But to do that, the first thing I want to do is rearrange them so my x's and my y's are grouped together, and then I'm going to get the 64 on the other side. So I'll rearrange my 4x squared minus 32x plus 9y plus 36y equals a negative 64. All right, so you can see now what I've done is I've grouped the x's, grouped the y's, and got my constant to the other side. Now I have enough to go ahead and complete the square. And I'm going to do complete the square separately for the x's and separately for the y's. Now remember, when completing the square, we want to be able to factor out the coefficient of our quadratic term. So in this case, I'm going to factor out a 4. And that's going to leave me with an x squared um, <coughs> minus 8x. Here, I can factor out a 9. So when I factor out a 9, I'm left with a y squared plus 4y equals a negative 64. All right, perfect. So now I have a coefficient of 1, and now I can apply the process of completing a square, which is going to produce a perfect square trinomial. Once I've produced a perfect square trinomial, I can factor it to a binomial squared, which is exactly what we want. So to produce that, what I need to do again is take, when we have a quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c, Right? Now we know b. To create that perfect square trinomial, we're going to pay, take b divided by 2 and square it. So I'll take, um, so let's do this, negative 8 divided by 2 squared. Negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. Then I'll do 9 divided by 2. I'm sorry, not 9. 4 divided by 2, right? Because that's my b over here. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 2 squared is equal to 4. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a 16 inside this parenthesis and a 4 inside this parenthesis. So we have 4 times x squared minus 8x plus 16 plus 9 times y squared plus 4y plus 4. Yeah equals a negative 64. Now, it becomes very, very important, though, that remember, whatever we add on one side, this is an equation, right? So whatever I add on the left side, I have to make sure I add on the right side. So since I added a 16 over here, I have to add a 16 over here. But notice that this is just not a single 16. We didn't add really 16. We added 16 times 4. So therefore, I need to do add 4 times 16. Then I need to add a 4 here. I need to add a 4 here. But really, that's a 4 times 9. So I need to add 9 times 4. Okay. So you can see how I added the 16 on both sides, added the 4 on both sides. Here, this 16 is being multiplied by 4. So here, this 16 is being multiplied by 4. Here, this 4 is being multiplied by 9. So here, this 4 is being multiplied by 9. Now, we, since we've created our perfect square trinomials, now we can factor them into binomial squares. That's the whole purpose of completing the square. And a lot of students you know, have trouble with factoring on this. But all we simply need to do is just um, rewrite this, factor this to a binomial squared, which is going to be 4 times, uh, this would be x minus 4 squared. Plus here, this would be 9 times, this is a binomial squared of y plus 2 squared equals negative 64. Um, 4 times <clears throat> 16 is going to be a positive 64. And then plus 36. So you can see, obviously, those go to 0. And I'm just left with 36. So I'm just going to rewrite that now as 36. Now, remember, our standard form of our equation, our, um, our formula equals 1. So I got to be able to solve this for 1. So to do that, I'm going to divide by 36. 
and I'm going to divide each one of these terms by 36. Then you can see now I can reduce this. Four, I divide out a 4 on the top and bottom, and that's going to leave me with a 9. Divide out a 9 on both ends, bottom, and that's going to leave me with a 4. Therefore, this is my formula is x minus 4 squared over 9 plus y plus 2 squared over 4 equals 1. OK. Whew. And that was just to get the formula. Um, we still got to graph this and identify everything. But I think what's most important now is <clears throat> understanding, OK, I have it in my, uh, you know, my cent in my, this form. Now I can identify what is my a and my b. And you can see that your a is always going to be the larger number for the ellipse. So that's going to be under the x. <clears throat> so my general equation is going to look like this, x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. So therefore, now I can start labeling my information. I know that hk, remember, it's x opposite of h, y opposite of k. So opposite x opposite. So that's therefore my hk is going to be positive 4, negative 2. And if you remember, the center is hk. So the center is h comma k. In the formula, it's opposite h opposite k. So therefore, my center is going to be positive 4, negative 2. All right, and now I can say that my a squared equals 9. So therefore, a equals 3. And my b squared equals 4. So therefore, b equals 2. And lastly, we need to do is figure out what our c squared is. So remember, c squared equals a squared minus b squared, which is going to be 9 minus 4, which equals 5. OK. So therefore, c equals the square root of 5. All right. So now, before we start identifying you know, our um, vertices, covertices, and foci, I think it's helpful to be able to graph this. Now, since we know that the graph has a, since a is under x, we know that the major axis is going to be horizontal, right? But the first thing we need to worry about is just graphing where the center is. And the center is at 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 2. So I plot the point and I label center. Now remember, since the a is under the x, the center, the vertices, um, the center, the vertices, and the foci all lie on the major axis. And since a is under x, that major axis is going to be horizontal. So when I want to find the vertices, I'm just going to be going along this line from the center. And remember, to find the, ver the vertices has a distance of a from the center. So I have a distance of a from the center. So if here, if I'm at 4, um, four 3, I need to go 3 to the right and 3 to the left. So 1, 2, 3. One vertice, one, two, three. Two vertices. So therefore, now I can write in my vertices as going to be um, 7, comma, negative 2, and 1, comma, negative 2. Notice how my vertices and my uh, center all have the same y, at, y coordinate, right? Because they all lie on this line. Um, the next thing is we can determine the covertices. The covertices are going to be what we call on our minor axis, which is perpendicular to the major axis. And again, those values are going, the distance from the center to your covertice is b. So I can go up to, down to, covertice, covertice. Now we don't really need to label the points, but we're going to use these to help us graph them. And the last thing is going to be our foci. All right, now the foci you can see is the square root of 5, which you can write as a decimal um, if you want to and just kind of approximate. I understand that two, 2 times 2 is going to be 4, and 3 times 3 is going to be 9. So the decimal is going to be somewhere between 2 and 3, right? So that's really all I need to understand is it's going to be 1, 2. It's going to be somewhere in here. I know it can't be 3 because that's where the vertice is at. Um, but it's probably going to be somewhere closer into the 2 range than the 3 range. And then I'll just label those as my foci. Now to write the points, um, to, since this is an irrational number, all I'm going to do is say 4 plus or minus, because that's all I'm doing is I'm adding square root of 5 and I'm subtracting square root of 5. And I know that since it lies on the major axis, 
that the y coordinate is going to be exactly the same as well. OK? OK? OK. Um, so we go and plot that. And now I just connect my vertices and my co-vertices. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. You have now graphed the parabola when it is not in your standard form. Thanks. Whew.